Jay Whitaker. I'm the director of the uh, Scott Institute for Energy Innovation here at Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm here to welcome you all to officially start uh, what we call Energy Week, which is three or four days of intensive sessions on energy. You all know it. That's why you're here. Um, before I do anything else, though, I want to deeply thank the staff of the Institute who have been uh, doing literally all of the work, uh, including part of the work is getting me to come up here and stand and say these things. Uh, not about them, but in general to, inter to welcome you all. So please, I want to specifically thank Anna and Amanda and Ginny and others who are outside for the incredible work to get all this put together. It's a lot of time and effort. Uh, all praises do them, uh, and I'm, I'm here as a vessel to, uh, to welcome you to the university and to Energy Week. Um, a little bit about the Scott Institute, if you don't know, uh, please visit our website. If you haven't, likely you have to sign up for this and so forth. Uh, we have about 150 to 160 energy experts here at CMU uh, that identify as either full-time or part-time researchers on some topic related to energy. Our job is to pull from these people uh, and to support these people uh, uh, energy things. Right? So we're trying to connect them, we're trying to uh, synergize research within the university, we're trying to synergize uh, uh, interactions with outside industry. Uh, and our goal really at the end of the year, at the end of the decade, is to make sure that we have changed the way um, energy is thought of both at CMU, within the region, and also nationally. We want to have an impact. We want to understand what that impact looks like. And part of it is bringing in worldwide experts to this week and having us all sit and talk and consider how things might change, what the future looks like, um, and hopefully to stimulate conversations amongst you all in the hallways and elsewhere. Uh, if you see any of us, please come and give us feedback. We'd love to understand what you think uh, went well, what didn't go well, how we can do better next year, um, and what sort of the pathway you think might look best for the Energy, Energy Institute. Uh, and so uh, this is also my second year of doing this. I uh, am very happy uh, with the progress. Each year we get more refined, we focus in, we understand how to, uh, to tailor this event uh, to the right kinds of people who are interested in learning the right kinds of things. Uh, so we really hope you enjoy this. Uh, I. Uh, this is just the very start. We have a good day and a half of very interesting, intensive programming, and I hope to run into you guys uh, either at the receptions or elsewhere in the hallway. would love to talk to anyone who is interested. Uh, so my next job is to introduce um, Michael McQuaid, who is our new uh, Vice President for Research. Uh, his job is to provide leadership at the university level to all the research that's going on at Carnegie Mellon. Um, he, uh, this position has been sort of moving around as far as like where it exists within our administration. Um, this iteration actually answers directly to the president. It's not part of the provost office. It's a very important position and he is, uh, you know, we're thrilled to have someone with, of his caliber to step in and to help lead the next generation of research projects, programs, and researchers here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, prior to coming to CMU, he served as Senior Vice President for Science and Technology at United Technologies Corporation, UTC. They do a lot of energy work. Uh, in fact, a lot of colleagues that I've worked with over the past years have in some way or other crossed over with uh, Michael. And so it was a real pleasure to sit down and sort of talk about the, the various paths that we've um, crossed uh, in, in the past. Um, and broad range of energy technologies focused on servicing uh, for the global aerospace and building systems industry. He's also held positions uh, tech development and business leadership at 3M, uh, Kodak, with broad experience managing basic technology development and the conversion of early stage research into business growth. Uh, he currently serves as a founding member of the Defense Innovation Board, an independent federal advisory committee that advises the Secretary of Defense on how best to advise to advance technical innovation. He also previously served on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and on the Secretary of Energy's Advisory Board. Um, most interestingly and importantly, he is a triple threat alumnus of Carnegie Mellon University, earning a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in physics for research conducted at the National Fermi, uh, Fermi uh, Lab National Accelerator. So before I, I say anything else, I just want to thank you <laughs> for coming uh, to CMU, and most importantly, thank you for coming today. Michael, Thanks, take it sir. over. Thanks. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here, and on behalf of our president, Farnam Jahanian, uh, and the entire leadership team at CMU, I want to thank you for being here for Energy Week. Um, I feel a little bit of full circle here in that I was, in my UTC days, one of the original sort of sponsors and the founding of the Energy Institute that led to Energy Week. Uh, I missed the last couple of years, so it's terrific to come back and see 
the energy and the focus of the program and the speakers and the engagement. So I'm really, really excited about that. I want to echo Jay's comments um, and thank uh, Executive Director uh, Anna and her whole team here. Um, some of you have done this kind of thing in the past, helped put on things like this. Uh, calling it a labor of love doesn't speak to how much you hate doing this by the time it's all over. Uh, but it is a spectacular amount of work, so thank you very much. Um, the Scott Institute for, for all of us is a prime example of what we talk about when we say CMU is about doing work that matters. So, so I would be disloyal and remiss and untrue if I did not try and help you understand how important the fundamental research that happens on this campus is to the campus, to the communities in which our researchers work, to the broad community here in Pittsburgh and, and, and beyond that. But as important as that fundamental research is, the founding ethos of this university is DNA that says we work on things that matter for our communities. And the Energy Institute, for which Energy Week is one primary uh, effort, really speaks to that. It is who we are as a university and our ability to bring renewed commitment from the whole university to the fundamental challenges that exist in the world today. That, that's what CMU is so good at. That's what all of you that are part of the CMU community make happen. Energy Week is also a very clear proof point of what I alluded to, that, that the most important problems are the ones we go after. Whether it is the future of work, whether it is the implications of AI, whether it is building a sustainable earth and a sustainable energy infrastructure and sustainable energy paradigm for all of us. These are the things that matter most to the world and they matter in ways that CMU is uniquely capable of, of calibrating and working on. <clears throat> um, there are a number of people here that I wanna recognize. We have been blessed with very strong support from the civic leaders uh, who not only provide what I would call civic guidance for all of us, the support that comes from their offices, but, but frankly it also is the civic wisdom that they bring to help us focus on what matters and what we work on. So I'm gonna introduce them. They will, um, various of them are speaking. I'm gonna introduce them all at once and some are still in the car getting here. They didn't have electric flying vehicles to get here, so. Um, but it, you will see the following people coming up here. Uh, Rich Fitzgerald who is a CMU alumnus and Allegheny County Executive. City of Pittsburgh Mayor uh, Bill Peduto is here. Uh, Councilman Corey O'Connor, who represents Pittsburgh's fifth district. And Grant Irvin, who's the Chief Resilience Officer at the City of Pittsburgh. I will also tell you that from my PCAST days that Jay alluded to, with the amount of work we did, not only on climate, but also on climate mitigation and adaptation, I am thrilled that there's actually a person in Pittsburgh who carries the title Resilience Officer. So I think that's terrific. Um, so I want to thank all of you for, for being here. I want to thank all of you for joining us here in the, in the uh, room today, but also for your participation across Energy Week. Uh, and with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce the first of those civic leaders that I mentioned, um, and that is Allegheny County Executive Rich Fitzgerald. Um, his, you know, CMU training, I would add, but also his commitment to really important work here in the county relative to job creation, economic stability, economic viability and development um, has been crucial to the community in which we all live together. Uh, under his leadership, we're investing in green infrastructure. We're combating complex environmental problems like air pollution and the unique geography that is Pittsburgh. And it's always a terrific pleasure to introduce Rich to the campus. So Rich, please, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it is always a pleasure to follow a triple threat when you get to do that, so congratulations. I want to congratulate, too, Anna uh, and Jay and Michael also for putting this on. Um, when they talk about full circle, I, I, I might win the award of the full circle. Uh, for, for those students that are sitting out there, um, it was 40 years ago uh, this time that as a, as a Mechie major uh, doing all those projects, there's two projects that come to mind as I was coming here today. The first project my class worked on was providing the energy savings if we timed the lights driving through Fifth Avenue down through Oakland. How much energy would be saved if you didn't have to stop at every single light and you, 
you timed that through. Because back in those days, it wasn't, we didn't talk about climate change. That wasn't on the, the agenda, but it was really about foreign oil that we had to purchase and what that meant to the country uh, at the time, back in the late 70s, early 80s. The second project was when we were reducing the speed limit on our turnpikes and interstates from 65 to 55 and how much energy savings that would be when you did the multiplication. So it brings back memories to hear what you're doing in the innovation as we, as we move forward in today's technology and how important it is, not just what CMU is able to do, but those of us in public policy as we run our organizations, the buildings and the, and the, and the vehicles and all the things that we're doing and how that matters. Um, some of the things that we're proudest of in, in Allegheny County, 35% of our energy is purchased by, for renewables on solar and wind. And we're looking to even get that above 50% over the next couple of years as we work on uh, sustainability and reducing our carbon footprint. We were one of the signatures along with the City of Pittsburgh to the Green Building Alliance. And that has been a great collaboration of the public sector and the private sector. And over that period of time, all those consor that consortium has saved over $85 million in energy and water usage during that time and over 400,000 metric tons of CO2, which is the equivalent of about a million cars or driving about a million miles in the vehicles that we have on a traditional car. So there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of importance that we do. I'll also say how important it is that our economic development team is here today, Lance Chimka and his team, so that when we do developments, when we partner with some of the job creation and some of the things that are mattering uh, to, to, the, to the economics of, of, of Allegheny County in this region, it's also important that these buildings and the development we have are sustainable, that we make sure they're done in a very environmental friendly way, not just the job creation, but what is the impact to the environment. And so the partnership that we have with you, some of the good ideas that will come out of these type of, uh, th these type of you know, consortiums are, are really important to us. So I wanna thank everybody for, for continuing to contribute. Anna, again, thank you for the, the collaboration uh, with Farnham, uh, Jahanian and his team. We're just so lucky in this region to have the partnership that we have with Carnegie Mellon and, and, and Farnham and, and the team. So I wanna thank everybody for what they're doing. I also wanna, wanna I guess I, my job is to now introduce uh, Co Councilman O'Connor. And I will tell you, Councilman O'Connor, uh, again, representing a lot of this area, uh, has been a great partner in promoting a lot of the green and a lot of the innovative type of, uh, of development that I just talked about. Whether it's in Hazelwood, whether it's throughout the city of Pittsburgh, you know, to make sure that the next generation of what we're doing uh, is very positive for the, for the folks that we're doing. So without further ado, let me introduce City Councilman Corey O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, the county executive mentioned, you know, timing red lights. The one thing I will say about the county executive, I've driven behind him and I've never seen him stop at a red light. So I don't know if that's for the energy and the environment or not. But um, the county executive does bring up a good point. Um, I, I wasn't gonna talk about it, but now that I'm here, I think I should. Uh, when we talk about sustainable energy, and we talk about green infrastructure. The county executive's mission has been to do a green first uh, plan at Alcasan. If you know what that is, that is our source system. It has 83 municipalities, and we are talking about spending about $3.5 billion in this region over the next 25 plus years on our storm system. And it's really important that we use green energy and new technologies to improve our infrastructure. And that's one project that the county executive has been a leader on uh, from the beginning. So I wanna thank him for his leadership on that. A Couple of things I wanna talk about. You know, when you represent a city of Pittsburgh, you have a lot of great community organizers, great community partners, but none is better than CMU. CMU over the years has been the leader in solar energy, in renewable energy, and each and every year they produce, their students and their faculty produce about 25 new energy related companies. Now why is that important? Because when we're talking about growth and we're talking about jobs in the region, CMU is our leader. One thing I wanna discuss, and I don't know if many of you know this site, but Hazelwood Green is about five minutes from here. And we've been looking for an anchor tenant for the last 15 plus years. A couple years ago, CMU and their advanced robotics manufacturing 
Institute got a $250 million grant from the federal government. They could have chose any site in the city of Pittsburgh, and they chose Hazelwood Green. One, because the site standards are to allow zero energy off-site. To renew all the energy in each and every building there is something that will make that site a world leader. But not only that, when we talk about being an anchor tenant in a community like Hazelwood that has been vacant since the steel mills have left and they need a break, and you go to your regional leader like CMU and they're going to be representing us down there, that's going to create jobs in the community. Not only jobs, but the future of that neighborhood and create wealth in a community that has not seen that in 30 plus years. And that's why we, we rely on CMU and the partners that we have in this room tonight, because we are looking forward to the future. We're looking to build a future that not only helps our companies and our businesses grow, but also brings each and every Pittsburgher to the table so that he or she has the ability to grow wealth within their community. And that's why these events are so important. So I'm really proud to be here today. I am looking one more time. So in politics, we have this thing, there's the county time, there's the council time, and then there's Mayor Peduto time. And unfortunately, he's running a couple minutes late, so I am going to introduce um, Grant Irvin from the mayor's office to talk to you about how the city's going to move into the future with sustainable, renewable energy. Thank you, Councilman, much appreciated. And after being on the mayor's staff, I've also learned to walk very slowly to the podium just in case he arrives um, uh, but if he if he does arrive in the next 30 seconds um, doesn't seem like it's so all I'll take it from here uh, so so thanks a lot uh, Anna and Amanda had asked me to share uh, a few slides uh, with you about the work that we're doing in the energy space uh, in the city of Pittsburgh um, so I wanted to uh, put together a couple of, of items for you just to share some insights, uh, some local insights. We've seen some, some global, some national trends um, and give you a sense of kind of the picture here on the ground um, that we've been working on and working on in very close collaboration uh, with our partners here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, you know, one of the things that is, Corey alluded to is having a, a research university like CMU and the University of Pittsburgh in your backyard um, really allows you to be the test bed for not just next gen technologies, but also uh, the ability to ta tackle kind of next gen problems uh, with kind of new processes. And one of the big things that we have started to do within the city of Pittsburgh has taken our sustainability program and morphed it with uh, this concept of resiliency. Um, and, you know, when we first started to do that, there was a lot of pushback uh, from, from members in the, particularly in the environmental community, just to be forthright about it, because the, the conventional wisdom was that resilience was about giving up. And that's exactly the opposite point of view. Um, in fact, one of the things that you come to learn within the resilience practice is it is essential to mold that with a sustainability practice. The idea that you can bring the concepts of endurance and sustainability uh, with the concepts of addressing your shocks and stresses and the need to not just bounce back but to bounce forward, which are some of the concepts of resilience or things that we're molding together in our programming and our policies. And one of the places that that takes shape is in infrastructure. Um, and not just thinking about infrastructure as static, aging, old pipes and lines and wires, but really dynamic tools that can help us build a more sustainable and resilient and just future. So what I wanted to do with you is, is kind of talk a little bit about our journey over the last four years um, and to show you kind of the point and direction that we're in right now. So we've been a partner uh, with 99 other cities around the world uh, in a network called the 100 Resilient Cities Network, uh, which is a program that was pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation. And in 2015, we began this deep uh, outreach process with community members, uh, both residents as well as subject matter experts, folks here at the university and industry, to understand what the shocks 
and stressors are that face the Pittsburgh community. Shocks being those potential immediate negative impacts, think a hurricane or an earthquake, uh, and stresses being those slow moving challenges that a community faces like aging infrastructure and economic and racial inequality. Things that are kind of embedded in your day to day challenges that you recognize but you endure and you kind of deal with versus kind of an in immediate negative externality like a shock. And with that information, we've been able to develop a series of strategies that have become our 1PGH platform uh, within the city of Pittsburgh. 1PGH is really based upon the ideas of a, a framework that we call P4, or people, planet, place, and performance, that allow us to start to look at ways in which we mold together uh, both those societal impacts as well as challenges like climate change. And out of that have come two other strategies that are now guiding our policies and investment decisions. The first is the Pittsburgh Climate Action Plan, which I'll talk about in a moment. The second is the equality indicators. As you note from the previous slide, one of the major challenges that we suffer from in the Pittsburgh region is structural inequalities. And we were told this time and time again by folks around the community, but we really didn't have a deep idea in terms of what that meant. The Equality Indicator is a program that we've pioneered with the RAND Corporation and the City University of New York has given us that first fundamental knowledge of understanding where inequalities exist and how we can start to shape the challenge to address them. We are now in a process of taking that information and pivoting towards the creation of the 1PGH fund, a social impact fund that would help address these inequality situations across our community and allow the community residents to address one of our other fundamental challenges, which is fragmentation, the inability to work across sectors around common challenges. If you look at this slide, and you probably can't see it from too far in the back, but one of the big things that we were able to identify within the equality indicators is this idea of where those challenges exist. And one of the things that I would point to this conference in terms of some of the relevancy is a lot of these inequality challenges have energy issues behind them. One of the main thrusts that we've come across is this concept of energy burden or the concept known basically as the per capita cost that a household spends on utilities. And we learned in our research that Pittsburgh is number one in the nation, and that's not a good thing. And that's not a function of the cost of utilities, it's the function of having an aging underinvested in housing stock. So just like much of our aging infrastructure, our housing stock suffers from some of those same crippling impacts of the lack of investment. That has upstream impacts on health, on job, and workforce development. So understanding how we can address some of these challenges is one of the, the energy issues of our time. We also developed the third Pittsburgh Climate Action Plan. Um, what I have before you here is the goals that we have developed within PCAP 3.0, which were uh, in large part shaped by members of the community and a, a large team here, at, frankly, at Carnegie Mellon, who helped us develop our next generation greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Um, so understanding that baseline that is required to reduce our emissions and our contribution to global warming. Our goals, simply put, are 100, 150, and zero. 100% renewable electricity, a 100% fossil fuel free fleet, 50% emissions reduction, and zero waste. And we've also, uh, by the guidance of City Council and adoption of City Council, have adopted these goals in addition to the divestment of our pension resources from fossil fuels all by the year 2030. These bold steps that we have laid on the table and have been formulated by members of our community have allowed us to become leaders nationally and globally in the conversation around climate change. This past year, we were acknowledged by the Bloomberg Philanthropies as one of the 25 recipients of the American Cities Climate Challenge. And I have a couple of my colleagues in the back from the city of Charlotte and Philadelphia uh, who are also members of that. So um, we're really proud to join this esteemed cohort of, of cities who are looking to reduce carbon emissions by 60 million metric tons over the next two years. Again, bold and ambitious, but as some of our previous speakers have laid out, doable. 
It requires a concerted effort. It requires us to reformulate how we procure and buy things. It requires changes to policies and practices, and it cannot be done alone. It's not just the city who is being faced with this challenge. It is all of us in this room. So in terms of this, though, it's not just about thinking about electricity all the time or natural gas or water. One of the other fundamental shifts that we've done over the past year has been to incorporate our sustainability and resilience team into our Department of City Planning. And what that has enabled us to do is to think about planning in a very integrated way. Every day, the Department of City Planning makes decisions based upon the built natural environment across our city. So incorporating sustainability and resilience into that practice has enabled us to start to think about policies and investment decisions in a different way. We've done that in two ways. One is to establish citywide plans like the Green Infrastructure Plan that Councilman O'Connor and the County Executive alluded to, as well as our Resilience and Climate Action Plans. But there's two other steps that we've added to that. One is the idea of thinking at district scale, uh, using what's called the Eco District Protocol to take a district scale approach, not just to community planning and design, but also infrastructure design and deployment. And it's within that that we can start to make structural decisions regarding to zoning, building performance, and infrastructure integration. I'm just going to go through these because I see that the boss is here. Um, so the Eco District Protocol, uh, a couple of interesting things about this is because of our leadership in this, uh, Pittsburgh will be hosting two major conferences, kind of a plug for both of these, because um, I think this audience will be interested in it. Um, in June, we'll be hosting the International District Energy Association Conference, um, which will bring about a thousand leading district energy practitioners from around the globe to Pittsburgh. And then in November, we'll be hosting the Eco District Summit, which will bring about 500 community planning practitioners here to Pittsburgh. This protocol has been applied most recently to the Uptown Eco Innovation District. Um, I remember it was a cold March day uh, in 2014 that we took a bus tour uh, with the county executive and the mayor, and that was the beginning of developing a community plan around the Uptown Corridor, which links together West Oakland, Uptown, the Hill District, and Downtown. If you come back to Pittsburgh in the next five years and you travel through that corridor, I guarantee you're going to see a fundamentally different place, one that is more dynamic, more community engagement, and fundamentally a healthier and safer place to live, all because of the community planning process. That community planning process has also started to spur a host of infrastructure investment. Uh, originally, the first key pillar to it was the bus rapid transit program, which is in about 60% design phase right now. But the first piece of infrastructure that we placed was a district energy plant through uh, our partners from Clearways, formerly NRG. But also now you're starting to see microgrid and district energy design to extend throughout that corridor. That has helped us spawn this idea of socially responsible microgrids in about seven other locations throughout the city that provide the same type of potential that we're designing in Uptown, as well as in Downtown, Oakland, the North Side, Hazelwood Green was mentioned, where these ideas of locally sourced clean and renewable energies can be applied. This helps to advance efficiency, reduce carbon footprint, and also build resilience uh, in terms of business operations and business continuity. Another kind of major thrust that we've developed has been the idea of integrating institutional master plans uh, through the universities and hospitals, bringing together partners like the University of Pittsburgh, UPMC, Carlo, U Carnegie Mellon, Duquesne University, where every 10 years we are required by law to update institutional master plans. This allows us to think about integrated energy infrastructure as well as the built natural environment in a fundamental way in which to encourage responsible development but also reduce the carbon footprint. This then starts to take shape at the building level. So thinking about integrating technologies like new land use regulations, incentives, and collaborations with consulting teams which are now starting to yield a new performance mechanism for us to look at buildings. The county executive talked about our 2030 district, which is one of the, the largest, it is the largest 2030 district in the world. We are now taking our institutional master planning process and taking that now to the building level to establish baseline energy use intensities for every major building project within those institutional master plans. 
That then allows us to focus on energy efficiency, on-site generation, green infrastructure, incorporating affordable housing, but also using existing buildings, which is some of the most energy efficient ways to redesign our buildings. A quick example of this is the uh, Mercy, the new UPMC Mercy Vision Center. Um, a really kind of proud moment for us and for those energy nerds, we reduced the EUI of the design building by over 50%. That's what I was looking for. So when UPMC came to us with, with the design, they, they brought what I called was a really 1993 approach to the building, which was, it looks good. It's a nice looking building. And we challenged them to understand how does the building perform? And through an, a, a three to four meeting iterative process, we were able to reconfigure systems, look at insulation, glazing, energy systems, on-site, off-site, to formulate a higher performing building right within our Uptown Eco Innovation District. A final aspect of this is about vehicle electrification. One of the key opportunities that we have in front of us here in Pittsburgh is to fundamentally change how we move around. One of the large focus and thrusts that we have had has been to encourage greater opportunities around walking and biking, which is our best opportunity to reduce carbon emissions, but also thinking about motorized transit in a way that allows us to change and address this new paradigm of vehicle electrification. So we have huge opportunities in front of us in terms of electrifying the, the Port Authority's fleet and electrifying both university as well as public fleets like at the city of Pittsburgh. By the end of the year, we'll have uh, 20 EVs in our fleet, um, five CNG refuse packers, which will then be able to convert over to RNG or renewable natural gas, um, and also the idea of shrinking fleet and thinking about how we adjust our mobility patterns have been key to that. So these are all kind of things that we were, we were testing you know, two or three years ago and now are actively deploying. And with that leads me to kind of my final point, which is we cannot do this alone, that the need for cross-sector collaboration is paramount in addressing the challenges of climate change and building a sustainable, just, and resilient future. Uh, and we can't do that without partners like Carnegie Mellon, Allegheny County, our utility and energy partners, and all of you in the room. So with that, I thank you very much. And Anna, I'm not going to introduce you. I'm going to introduce <laughs> I'm going to introduce my boss, Mayor Peduto, um, to the stage. And uh, as he comes up, uh, uh, most of you know Mayor Peduto, so I won't go into all the details. But without his leadership, we wouldn't be able to be uh, as advanced in the work that we're doing. And for that, I'm thankful. And it's good to see you back from vacation. Thanks, sir. buddy. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So don't we? So about, what, four years ago? No, about six years ago, five years ago, we sat down for a cup of coffee. Grant was, uh, said he wanted to run for city council. And I said to him, why? You have one child, you have another one on the way. Why would you want to be in church basements at 9 p.m. being yelled at by two different sides about trying to get something accomplished? I need you to be our uh, sustainability guy. And he thought about it and decided, yeah, I'll do that. And through his leadership, uh, not only is he now the chief resiliency officer in that we have an, an assistant director of planning and where sustainability and resiliency is now a key component of all the decisions that we make, but he's also been able to be around this nation and around this world recognized as one of the top CROs anywhere in any city. And one of the partnerships that we created was with the Rockefeller Foundation and the 100 Resilient Cities. And we were together last year in Bellagio, on Lake Como, where the Rockefeller Center's uh, campus is. And I looked at Grant as we looked across that lake, and I said, do you still regret not being a city councilman? <laughs> and he just laughed. So thank you for yeah. your leadership thank on you. this. Yeah. Um, it needs to be recognized. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, two things. First off, I'm on a vacation high. I just uh, left Pittsburgh for two weeks for the first time since 2011 and got back a couple days ago. And uh, 
On my journey, I was uh, in Dharmasala, India, where I got to meet with His Holiness, uh, the Dalai Lama. And when I met him, uh, and we were going at the residence into a room for a 45-minute discussion, he looked at me and he grabbed my hair and he said, this is black. And he grabbed my beard and he said, this is white. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I didn't know what to say. I just kind of looked at him and I was going to say, that's the way God made me, but I didn't want to start this conversation about Buddhism and the belief of God. So I just <laughs> let it go at that and uh, have this wonderful conversation. But while I was over in Asia and I had the uh, opportunity not only to be in India, but Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, and Japan. The conversations that I had when I had the opportunity to talk with local elected officials were the same conversations that we have at a conference like this. No matter where it is in the world that you live, cities are leading in the discussions on how we can address climate change, how we can reduce our carbon footprint, and what the new technologies and industries are going to be and where they're going to be created. And in Pittsburgh, we have a competitive advantage against cities that are much larger than us, in that we're small enough that when we create these public-private or public-public partnerships, we can actually implement them. But we're big enough that the world will take notice. So we have this vision of where we want to go by 2030. We want to be able to create a network of independently operated energy providing sources in a district level to provide the opportunity to transfer through a just transformation into renewable energy that would power this entire city. By 2030, we want to purchase all of our operational energy through renewable sources. We want to be able to increase our fleet and our building management systems to be able to reduce the amount of energy that we're using from today to the 2030 by 50 percent. And we want to get to 100 percent, uh, basically zero waste, where our, our use of garbage and the, the materials that uh, we have today are not going into the land, but are actually being used to produce energy or other types of sources. So these are all the goals. And as we go through this process over these next 11 years, it's not going to be city government that is doing it. It is going to be the partnerships and who is enabled to be able to help us to reach those goals that will be the critical players. So what does that mean? That means that campuses like this at Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh and the Swanson Engineering Center are going to be our critical partners in being able to make that action occur. It means that companies, companies like Peoples Gas, that have traditionally been a fossil fuel industry, will be given the opportunity to create new renewable sources of energy and to be able to pilot it here so that they can expand their portfolio and then expand it across this country and across this globe. And we want to find those creative people, those ones that are working on the next idea of not only energy conservation, but energy production, and work to make Pittsburgh the model of it. When Grant showed you that map, that really looked in between the rivers and the north side where we have already begun district energy ex experiments and working to create them on a larger scale. At some point, that map should be the entire city of Pittsburgh. We shouldn't think about the way energy is produced today in thinking of a factory 50 miles away that's burning coal and transmitting it across a line where it's losing all of its efficiency, and then by the time that you turn your toaster on in the morning, about 38% of the energy that was produced is actually being utilized. We should think about how we can produce energy in every neighborhood. Kinetic energy, energy through solar, energy through wind, all the different ways that in the future energy will be produced, and we should be doing it at a scale that helps to be a part of the development of this next Pittsburgh. That's why it's absolutely critical that Grant is in that position in the planning department. Because as we look to rebuild neighborhoods, 
the component of energy is as critical as the zoning decisions that are made on the height of a building or how many people are living inside of it. And we need to make it based on a community level. So forget about the conversations in Washington. It's, it's one thing for Washington to say, this is where resources will be going to, and that is really helpful. But despite who is in the White House, the true changes that we're looking for are going to happen at the local level. And they're going to happen in cities around the world. And they're not gonna be based on a top-down design of city governments and county governments leading the effort, but instead on how cities and counties can enable those with the ideas to move ahead. And those cities that get that will be on the leading edge of a new energy industry. And those will be the cities that will see the jobs and economic growth occur because of it. Now, Pittsburgh has always been a leader in energy. Coal was discovered on the Monongahela River in Pittsburgh. Oil, just north in Venango County. Drake as well. Natural gas, we sit on one of the largest, Marcellus and Utica, Utica Shale. But as we look into the transition into the future, and as the world is looking for leaders to be able to find renewable sources of energy, we have the ability right here to implement it over these next 11 years and allow for that just transition to occur. Not like turning on a light switch, but understanding from a city that watched as we went through an economic depression and a recession because we never prepared for a collapse of the steel industry, how we can make sure that those who work in the mining industry in Fayette County and in the natural gas industry in Washington and Green can be a part of that transition in helping us to get there. And as we take care of the planet, we also take care of people. That's what makes Pittsburgh unique. That's what separates us from ideas that are being presented today that are either going to the far left or the far right. We're practical and pragmatic, but we're also innovators and leaders. And we have this opportunity right now, right now, to lead in a new energy innovation economy. So to those that are here and that for the next few days, come up with the next great idea. Come up with those next great small ideas. Let Grant know about them. Let the county executive know about them. And what I can tell you is we will enable, empower, and get to work rolling our sleeves up like Pittsburghers do to see it happen. Thank you. Welcome to Pittsburgh to those visiting, and we welcome your ideas. No, but I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Anna Siefkin, uh, who is the executive director the Wilton, of the Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy Innovation here at CMU. Uh, Anna is a, is a dear friend and colleague, and uh, you know, we, we jokingly call her the GSD. Folks know what that is? It's get stuff done, but we use another word. Um, she's one of our key points of contact here at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, we really relish her, her partnership and collaboration at the city of Pittsburgh. Um, it's interesting, so we started working with Anna back uh, when she was the executive director of the uh, 2030 district at the Green Building Alliance. Um, so thankfully she didn't go too far when she uh, transitioned. Um, she just went up the street here to Oakland and to Carnegie Mellon and we're thrilled to have her here in this role uh, at CMU and uh, you know, can't say enough good things about her, I'll keep it brief. Um, but um, we really relish the partnership with you, Anna, and thank you for pulling us all together because I know great things are going to happen um, coming out of the next couple days here. So please welcome Anna Siefkin, everyone.
Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see such a full room this afternoon. I really appreciate it. I'll, this will be a combination of housekeeping and, and a few introductions and some thank yous. Um, I do want to make sure that those of you that are standing in the back, we have chairs up front, in fact, plenty of chairs, and I know that the folks in the back never want to sit in the front, but there are chairs available, so please do fill in. So as, as you've heard over the last few minutes, obviously this is the fourth annual uh, CMU Energy Week. We're so excited to have you here. There are about 800 people that are registered over the next uh, four days. Uh, this room doesn't hold 800 people, so we are very excited. And some, occasionally you might have to stand, but we are going to bring in as many people as we can to be in this conversation because it's so important. I want to start by thanking some of our sponsors um, who make this uh, event. It remains free, so they help us to uh, make sure that we are, are staying that way for not only all of the students that are here, but also the folks that have traveled from far and wide, uh, People's Gas and Chevron. Um, the American Made Solar Prize, which is from the Department of Energy, Next Era Energy Resources, uh, Duquesne Light Company, and VentureWell. Um, as well, I'd like to thank, uh, we're going to get to the point where there, we have so many that I'm not going to be able to name all of them, but obviously we have quite a few additional partners that have made this all possible. So thank you to all of those partners. I also want to say thank you to our conference and event services. So obviously we have a, a number of people um, that are helping behind the scenes with communications, folks that are volunteering, particularly the Tepper School of Business Energy Club. And at conference and events, event services, we have Monica, Reagan, and Chelsea, who you will see running around over the next couple of days. And I would be absolutely remiss if I did not thank this particular energy goddess, um, Amanda King. Um, who I believe is probably running around right now trying to help uh, get some things organized. But Amanda, oh, there she is. <laughs> nice entrance. So Amanda has been integral in, in making sure that this uh, whole event moves very smoothly. So thank you to Amanda. I also want to thank Jenny Delaney and Aswarya Raja. Aswarya just finished um, and probably has done the first uh, of her several breathing out uh, exercises. She finished a hackathon um, this morning. We had about 90 students who were on campus for our first ever hackathon. Um, and they created, uh, or they solved, solved, worked diligently for 24 hours on five challenges. And we will be announcing those winners at around 2 o'clock. So they are standing by for that. Also, thank you to our interns, Cody and Jessica. So I know that Jay talked about this at a high level a few minutes ago, but I wanted to give you a few more details about the Scott Institute. We've been around since 2012. Uh, we work on helping to solve the biggest uh, energy challenges in the world. So our 150, 160 faculty members are actively engaged in that every day. And we do that through um, our partnerships, through sponsored research, um, and through creating um, additional opportunities where we can showcase our talent. So I know that we have a number of faculty in the room. I'd like to make sure that you all, if, if you're a faculty member and you're teaching at Carnegie Mellon, could you please raise your hand? We have quite a few. All right, so I want to make sure that you all get a chance to connect one with each other through the course of the time. Um, and what we do specifically, we do support those faculty, we support entrepreneurs and startups, we have an active ecosystem for startups in the local area. We form partnerships including centers that are looking at different areas of uh, importance, uh, particularly uh, machine learning and AI in the energy space. Um, we have public sector partnerships with NETL and DOE, and we host strategic initiatives and events like this. So if our job is to make sure that people understand exactly what we're doing at Carnegie Mellon, we see Energy Week as just one of many vehicles to convey that to all of you. So our areas of expertise, we've been fine tuning these over the last um, year or so because we have so many faculty, we wanted to understand exactly what they work on. So it turns, on, it, it turns out it's energy technologies for the future. So that's renewables and transportation, electri transportation electrification, energy storage and batteries. I know we talked, Jay mentioned the importance of batteries. We're also focused on decarbonization um, and some incredible work that's happening here in those areas. We're also looking at resource efficiency, policy and analysis. So that would be sort of the, the monitoring, the sensing, the energy policy, the things that enable um, energy transformation to happen. And then finally, when you think of Carnegie Mellon, you think of robots and machine learning and next gen technologies. Well, we have that for energy too. So between grid modernization and energy planning through high performance computing, data centers, machine learning and AI, 
all important focus areas for Carnegie Mellon. A lot of this is recapped in a report that you can find online. It's called Impact. Uh, we actually took our first several years and sort of consolidated all of the information about the Scott Institute. So we have this available online. It's the best way to actually access the information. But you can read all about the work that we're doing. Part of it is we highlight our faculty. And so we do have quite a few faculty that are doing some incredible things. Uh, Tony Rolette um, has led a team with Argonne National Labs to unlock a keyhole phenomenon in metal 3D printing, for example. And Constantine Samaras um, is not only um, partnering closely with the Department of Energy, but he's also was named the American Society of Civil Engineers Pittsburgh Section Professor of the Year. So we have folks that are out and about. They are interested in meeting with you and talking with you, so I want to make sure that you make yourselves available and, and find each other. So in terms of the next couple of days, uh, at 1 o'clock, we will have Tom Siebel, who is the chairman and CEO of C3AI. He will be speaking with us in just a few short minutes coming up. Um, we will have a student research poster showcase that's happening during your afternoon break. So make sure you take a look at that. There is a People's Choice Award. So we want to make sure that you see the posters. They will be in Rangos 3, which is the other side of that wall, which is where you will always find food. Um, Brian Anderson, who is the newly named director for NETL, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, um, is going to be talking this afternoon at 515. And we have an incredible evening tonight. We have CMU alumni uh, Harmet Singh, who is the CTO for Greenlots, which was recently acquired by Shell, giving a talk about electrification and the future of, of um, EVs and technology in cities. Um, and that's followed by kind of a reactionary panel about the importance of energy and infrastructure with the heads of the authorities from the city of Pittsburgh. So pretty interesting panel that we have coming together. In terms of tomorrow, um, Michael O'Sullivan, who is the SVP for development for Next Era Energy Resources, will be talking about um, energy, uh, excuse me, utility scale wind and solar power, sort of the importance of those things, particularly as we're looking at southwestern Pennsylvania. Barbara Berger, newly appointed president of Chevron Technology Ventures out of Houston, will be speaking um, about why corporations care. And they have a huge new fund. Uh, we have a lot of enthusiasm around the startup community, as I mentioned. Matthew Norton is going to be speaking about energy tech fundraising. Um, and he is with Prime Coalition. And then finally, we have a reception tomorrow afternoon at the Tepper Quad, which is our newest building on campus. Um, it's a LEED certified building. All right. So almost to the end of what we're going to talk about in terms of housekeeping. Um, on Thursday, we are doing our second annual CMU Energy and Clean Tech Investor Forum, which will be, uh, we've done a few things to change the program. There are some public sessions, including Ken Hayes, who will be speaking at 9.30 in the morning. Um, after that, we have a panel of investors from around the country that are going to be talking about what they're seeing um, in other areas and what they'd like to be seeing here in Pittsburgh. Um, and then we will have a, a pitch showcase in the afternoon. It's actually from 12 until 1.30. So if you have not registered, that's an interesting session to hear our startups from the local community. We're giving them four minutes to make a pitch for their companies. And then finally, we end the day with a tour of Scott Hall and also Phipps Conservatory. So if you are using social media, uh, these are the hashtags and handles. Obviously, we want to make sure that if you snap a picture that you're sending it out and we will retweet it. Um, that's part of what Amanda is probably running around doing as well. And back to Slido. I know I mentioned this standing up, but I want, I want to tell you a little bit more about this. So if you go to Slido.com, you put in hashtag CMU Energy. It'll provide you the opportunity to ask questions. And so throughout the couple of days, you'll be able to ask questions by session. And the good news is that we archive all of those questions. So even if you can't get your answer immediately, we'll be able to find out um, and get an answer for you at a, at a future time if you're interested. Finally, Wi-Fi. Um, there is a card on the middle of your table that not only has those Slido directions, but it also has um, information about Wi-Fi so that you can get online. We do want to make sure that you're registered. Many of our sessions are filling up fast. Um, I recommend uh, if you have a chair that you love and you're about to go get a meal, leave a coat in that chair or it will be gone when you get back. 
um, do make sure that you sil silence your cell phones, tablets, et cetera, so that we can make sure to enjoy all of our guests. And if you are visiting us uh, from out of town, I want to make sure that you take a look at CMU's campus and that you spend some time in Pittsburgh. So I took a small group of folks yesterday up to Mount Washington, um, which is, as was mentioned, used to be Coal Mountain. And so having that perspective and seeing our city in this time of transition is a really, really important part of your visit to Pittsburgh. So we're very glad to have you here, so many of you, and we are really looking forward to a fantastic couple of days.